Yeah, but let's go now to the murder trial of Derek Chauvin. The f uh, former officer decided against taking the stand yesterday. Chauvin invoked his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, passing up his final chance to give his side of the story to the jury. Have you made a decision uh, today whether you intend to testify or whether you intend to invoke your Fifth Amendment privilege? Uh, I will invoke my Fifth Amendment privilege today. With that decision, the defense rested its case. Let's bring in professor of law at Georgetown University, Paul Butler. He's an MSNBC legal analyst and former U.S. attorney, now an NBC News law enforcement <clears throat> an analyst. Chuck Rosenberg is with us this morning. Good to have you. Gentlemen, both. thank you for being with us. Uh, Paul Butler, was it just uh, too much of a risk uh, for the defense uh, to put the defendant on the stand? It, 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 I mean, and were you expecting this? Was this a surprise? Uh, or, or did you think this was the, the most prudent uh, move for the defense? Joe, the conventional wisdom was that this person would not take the stand precisely because it was a great risk. Jurors like to hear from the person who was on trial but if Chauvin had taken the stand, he risked being destroyed on cross-examination. Prosecutors would have taken him through every second of that nine minute and 29 second video. And he might have opened the door to the juror hearing about the many complaints that citizens have filed against him in other cases. Chuck. Um... Are, are juries more or less likely to convict a defendant because they refuse to testify? Yeah, I don't know that they're more or less likely. They're instructed, Joe, by the judge that um, Mr. Chauvin, like all defendants, has a Fifth Amendment right, an absolute privilege not to testify, and they're told to ignore that. And so for what it's worth, I probably tried 50 or so um, criminal cases in federal court can count on one hand the number of times that a defendant would testify. It's rare. And I think jurors really, truly do try and follow the instructions of a judge to put that aside and to not hold it against him. And by the way, you know, Paul's exactly right. Um, Chauvin would have been subjected to a withering cross. But remember, the core of his defense at this trial was that he did not cause Mr. Floyd's death right, that Mr. Floyd died because of underlying health reasons and the like. And so Chauvin's testimony, had he taken the stand, could not have gone to that central issue. He doesn't know anything about cause of death. So it also, uh, for the reasons that Paul stated, but also it makes sense not to take the stand if you really can't add anything that's going to materially help you. Yeah. So, Chuck, uh, with with all the experience that you've had uh, trying cases and being a professional prosecutor for years, uh, most of us uh, look at this uh, trial and we think it's a fairly open and shut case uh, for the prosecution. But, of course, in these sort of cases involving police officers, it's never an open and shut case. So knowing that, if you're on this prosecution's team and the jury's going into deliberation, what are you going to be most concerned about? I was always concerned, Joe, about that one juror, for whatever reason, who didn't get it or didn't care. Look, I think the prosecution did a terrific job. I thought their presentation was compelling. It was logical. It was linear. I thought they adduced facts in a really thoughtful way. I thought their experts were wonderful. So if I had a bet, and I'm not a betting guy, uh, the prosecution has done everything it should do and would likely prevail, except for one thing. You need 12 jurors. It must be unanimous. One holdout juror, and you can always have somebody on the panel who doesn't see it the way the prosecution saw it. One holdout juror can, 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 can mean the difference between a conviction and a hung jury, which is a mistrial. And that's what I always worried about. Even when I thought my case went well, even when I thought I proved everything I needed to prove, I worried about that holdout juror. And Paul, I ask you the same question. Based on everything you've seen in the prosecution's case and now everything you've seen in the defense case, if you're worried about that one juror, what element of uh, the, the, the case, what, what, what 
what part of this trial would concern you most as a prosecution that put on a, a, a strong case? Is it the causation part? Uh, are you worried that maybe one juror is going to, to listen to some of the testimony that says, well, he could still breathe, he could still talk, he could still... Uh, it, it, so it suggests that maybe it was drugs or maybe it was something, a, a, a weak heart that caused his death. Uh, Joe, the prosecution presented one of the most compelling cases ever in the case of a police officer for murder, pros being prosecuted for murder. The defense had a very difficult time responding to the overwhelming evidence of excessive force. And you're right, if there's any issue that they're worried about, that the prosecution is worried about, it's causation, because the defense did a, a better job on the issue of what killed Mr. Floyd. Remember, they don't have to prove anything. All the defense has to do is raise reasonable doubt that Mr. Chauvin is responsible. So they let the jury consider a meth overdose, a phenytoin overdose, heart disease, lung disease, COVID-19, carbon monoxide poisoning. And now we'll have to see if that strategy worked with any of the jurors if it just worked with one, that's a mistrial. Chuck Paul mentioned carbon monoxide. That was introduced by a defense expert, the former medical examiner in the state of Maryland, who suggested it could have been carbon monoxide poisoning that killed George Floyd as he was laying on the ground near the vehicle for so long. Well, the prosecution brought in another witness, actually brought back a witness, Dr. Martin Tobin, a pulmonologist, to refute that claim yesterday. Let's listen. As to the statement that his carboxyhemoglobin could have increased by 10 to 18 percent, in your view, that's not possible. It's simply wrong. And it was at most 2 percent? At, at most 2 percent. Normal. Very, I mean, which is normal. So, Chuck, they're talking there about the oxygen saturation levels for George Floyd at 98 percent, which was normal, and saying it's simply wrong that carbon monoxide killed him. So as you look at the core defense for, for Officer Chauvin here from his team, it's that perhaps it was underlying health conditions or drugs that killed George Floyd. The prosecution had witnesses refuting that. Or that there was an angry, threatening crowd around Officer Chauvin, and somehow that compelled him to stay in that defensive crouch. Have they made those connections well enough in your judgment for a jury to have some doubt about the guilt of Officer Chauvin here? I don't think so. I agree with Paul. I thought the case was compelling and logical and overwhelming. Look, the defense tried the angry crowd um, trope. And we saw the crowd, Willie. We, we saw the crowd that the officers saw. Yep. They were upset, but they were upset because a man was being killed, murdered in front of their eyes. They weren't threatening the police. And oh, by the way, as the prosecution pointed out, uh, the police on the scene didn't call for backup. They didn't feel that threatened. As to cause of death, look, I do think the defense did a better job here. I do think that they introduced or tried to introduce some doubt. The clip you just played of Dr. Tobin getting back on the stand in the prosecution's rebuttal case was done perfectly. It was short. It was to the point. It made the argument that the oxygen saturation levels were so high that it could not have been carbon monoxide poisoning. In fact, I remember Dr. Tobin saying that everybody in this room, referring to the courtroom in which he was sitting, uh, has some amount of uh, carbon monoxide in their system, no different than George Floyd did on the day that he died. And so I think that the prosecution by far had the better of the arguments and the better of the evidence. It remains to be seen how the jury reacts to it. Hey, thanks so much for watching our YouTube channel. You can follow up on today's top stories and breaking news or catch up on your favorite MSNBC shows all in one place. Download the NBC News app today.